So we have Mike Riley in our living room today. Not many people can actually say they've had Mike Riley in their living room. That probably came out wrong. That we've hosted actually, Mike Riley in our living room. That's right. I was going to say a lot of people have had Mike Riley in their living room, haven't they? They have, actually. While we're on yes. TV. <laughs> and it's quite a, a strange set of circumstances because you're here in our living room because we're all in San Diego because you're a native... San Diegan, or you've lived here most of your life? Uh, you know, it, since like 76, so I I say really a big time semi, semi, semi native, you know, <laughs> close to being here. You know. But we, we know you for a unique set of circumstances, right? Yeah. We do, actually. Uh, your daughter uh, and uh, son-in-law were our neighbors. And so <laughs> when we were chatting down with bikes down there, I said, oh, yeah, my dad uh, is in triathlon, Mike Riley. Like, wait, Mike? The Mike Riley? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah so but, just... but I, heard, I heard the real story. You put him off right away. Right, right. Oh, God, <laughs> this guy's going to be asking me all kinds of questions because they got 32 bikes hanging in my <laughs> garage. <laughs> no, you know. We were like, who is this schmo? That's what we're thinking. <laughs> That's right. But your career, Mike, um, started in, you were a middle school teacher, weren't you? In I, I, I was. I was a special ed teacher. That's how I got to San Diego. Oh. I graduated uh, in T Toledo, Ohio, and got a special ed degree. And my brother lived here. He's like 12 years, 13 years older. And I said, well, if I'm going to teach, why not do it where I've been before in San Diego, where I can... I can run in shorts every day. I was going to say, it's such, a, it's, it's, it's such an awful place, isn't it? Who would want to be here? It's just terrible. Thank, you know, it's, it, it's tougher now for younger generations because it's so expensive. Yeah. Uh, I knock on wood that, you know, we got in early enough and we're in the, with the real estate and all that stuff. But So this would have been, what, in the late 70s? Se yeah, late 70s. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. then you started to do a few local, when you first got behind the microphone, uh, and then your first professional call was what in the early 80s at Solana Beach just up it, the road it was it was uh it was in 78 it was a 10k down right here oh, Mission okay, Bay right, right. uh that that was the very first but triathlon it was 79 or 80 oh. I well, think, what, uh, what was it like calling your first race well I I was I was gonna run it and it was a 10k at Mission Bay I was running all kinds of miles and uh, but I had a bad hamstring so but I went to the race anyway because I had a lot of buddies and mates doing the race so I get there and it takes off and the race director who I knew and she knew me, she goes, what are you doing? I go, I can't run. I got the bad hammy. She goes, I went and got this microphone and this speaker. It had one of those old megaphone speakers on a pole. And here's the printout of the list. Why don't you call their names when they're coming, they come in? You, you know them. And I go, first thing I thought of, I go, oh my God, I can crank some of my friends when they come Oh, that's in. awesome. You I can go. rib them as they come that's across right. the but line. But people were coming and I'd call out the time of the winner and then I'd look at the name, you know, number and the name and I'd call their name out and people would go and say congratulations or well done or you look good. And, and I got all these great responses from people. Then they came up to me afterwards and go, dude, that was, you called my name and said, that's so cool. And I go, yeah, that's what I'd like to hear if I would run races a lot, which I was, but we didn't have people on the microphone that mm -hmm. much. And I go, well, this is pretty cool. And she kind of just kept asking me and I kept saying yes. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, a huge reason why we wanted to chat to you on this podcast today, because I think kind of your verve and excitement and passion for endurance sport. I mean, you're known for, of course, Ironman and calling an Ironman. But I think endurance sport in general, right? I think what you've experienced, what you've seen across those finish lines and your continued passion for the sport is just so, so unique. I've seen it in person. I see it, you know, in your soul, what it means to you. Um, and I think we kind of just wanted to dig into some of that stuff today, you know, like uh, whether it's adversity or healing through sport, um, you know, a lot of the joyous aspects, the, the, the team, the, you know, the group of it all. Um, yeah, so we kind of want yeah, to jump into that. And coming from the Xterra world, which we obviously do, and we see that firsthand as well, right? You mm -hmm. see these athletes in tears, partly because of the discomfort and pain, but just because of the sense of accomplishment. And then we thought, the sorts of people that get to be a little part, a few minutes of people's lives after anywhere from eight to 16 hours, of course, of their pain and suffering. And then, so you must have been, you've seen those journeys firsthand, whether it's a transformational one, a completion or marriages, proposals, yeah. <laughs> all the gamut. And so have you noticed over the years that there have been any changes in the sorts of stories you've seen? Or has it been always kind of like 
these ultimate endurance events that have really endured in people's lives? Well, people are more willing to let you know what their backstory is more uh -huh. than in the past. So if somebody's running on behalf because he or she lost a partner uh, or lost a child, those types of things have come out more in the past, in, in, not of late, say the last 10, 15 years. Before that, you really didn't. I didn't know somebody had cancer if they were crossing the finish line in 1982. They never really mm -hmm. said anything about mm -hmm. it. And, but in the event world of Ironman, Xterra, you know, Mission Bay 10K, whatever it may be, my passion really, it's, it's really more about the athlete and the person and the accomplishment that we're witnessing in front of us. And we all want to be congratulated. We all don't need it every day and we have a lot of self fire in us to keep pushing forward. But when somebody goes through hell to get to a finish line and a start line and you kind of know about it, you want to let them know they're the best thing in the world right there. They're the best thing in the world. And what they did for themselves, nobody else could do for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They did it. So when I see that, I celebrate that even more than the event itself. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. You know, and I've announced obviously plenty of Ironmans, but over a thousand other endurance events through my career. Mm -hmm. And the story is the same at that finish line. It's accomplishment. It's desire to finish what you start, which is one of the best lessons in Oof, life. Right. And it's also about the passion of somebody becoming somebody different. Mm -hmm. it, about becoming mm -hmm. somebody that they didn't know was inside them until they put in the time and the training and got through that hard day, whether it's a, you know, 50 minute 10 K or a 17 hour Ironman, they got through it and I get to congratulate them. That's why Les, my passion is there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then I see him glow right in front of mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. and, and, and out the crowd, because I read crowds very well. I'll say something about somebody, call him the champion, call him an Ironman, call him a finisher, whatever I do. And then the crowd picks it up from there. And they go, oh my gosh. And they give, in, they give even more to that person finishing. So it, I try to explain a lot of it when, you're, when you put it into words, into a book, but I, I, I seem to be able to talk about it more because I get so ingrained in, in what those people, you know, what our, what our peers have been doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you can see that it's life changing. You see it firsthand mm -hmm. that it, it is like a, a, a movie of that person, mm. right? That character arc that we talk about in, in screenwriting yeah. and storytelling. It is their own story playing out in front of them in which they've accomplished a form of greatness. And I think that, um, you know, for me personally, right, I think digging deep into the soul on the day in, the day out of training, on the good days, on the bad days. And you really get to know yourself pretty intimately when you're facing those fears, when you're dealing with pain. I mean, it's it's quite a bizarre thing when mm -hmm. you're dealing with pain in terms of what it does to your brain. It, it does, but I think that one of the things that I've always fascinated, I've always found, I mean, coming at it from a psychological perspective, right, right as my lens that I look through. Uh, life, I gotta, yeah, you got to figure this out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I, I'm going to need a bigger net. I'm going to need a bigger net. <laughs> um, it, it's it's the fact that you know along the storyline line is that I think people want to have a story about their own life right which is an identity that they're proud of and I think especially now ultimate or endurance events especially the kind of like extreme endurance events people want an identity or a storyline and their own narrative that they they're kind of proud of and I think Iron Man and other these other longer distance events there is the same fits into that nicely and we see that right the the, the badge of honor that people wear sometimes literally they have tattooed mm -hmm. things or mm -hmm. sometimes the, the the gear that they're wearing and so on that part of to, a chance to define themselves in a way that perhaps was not what, where they've come from or not the story that they've had and that is so transformational and you've seen that first time. and and you 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 nailed it, Simon, because so many have gone through life without ever being told that they're going to amount to anything. I read that in people's bios all the time. My father never said this to me. My mother, I was a foster child. Da, da, da. And all of a sudden, they start figuring out, well, guess what? I can say it to myself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll have people sign up for an event, tell me about it, and then tell me about their family saying... Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. 
why would you why do you want to put yourself yeah. through that and 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 can you imagine battling against that with from family and loved ones they love them and everything but they uh, you don't want to do what 140.6 miles you want to you want to ride a mountain bike over the I don't get it. yeah Mine. why would you do that mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they put in the training and the time and they do it and they congratulate themselves mm -hmm. They turn a lot of people's thinking about them around, especially family and friends. Like, oh my gosh, because anything is possible. Right. Mm -hmm. They That's just the ended up it? realizing it on their own, which yeah. is even more powerful than, than your coach going, this is what you have to do and you got to do that. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, you, you know, I got to do another repeat on that thing. I know I need a little more. Mm -hmm. Or no, I'm going to back off. I, you know, and, yeah. and people instinctively can take care of themselves much better than they think they can. That's mm -hmm. true, absolutely. We had a guest about uh, probably six months or so ago, a guy named Brad Stolberg, and he's an author and an endurance athlete, writes a lot, writes for Outside Magazine, New York Times, and so on. And he wrote an article for Outside Magazine about why are, uh, I, think he, I think the title of the article probably clickbait a little bit, why are rich people attracted <laughs> to paying for pain, right? And what this really, I think he means is, is, listen, these extreme endurance of sports, they tend to attract people with, money and time they're predominantly a middle class middle to upper class sport diversity we know has been a bit of an issue in endurance sport but what is it about the sorts of people who seem to be voluntarily paying to go through kind of what seems like hell and back to have these transformational journeys and one of the conclusions from the research was that first off the, the kinds of people that do these sports they stem usually what you know knowledge workers they 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 they're thinking for a living versus doing they're not you know there's there's not that much manual labor right. in in triathlon and so on so they're com at computers all day or you think and in that world it's really difficult to find a sense of clear objective accomplishment and moving to finding an opportunity to have some physical discomfort almost harking back you know from an evolutionary perspective when we used to when we were forced to have that when we those people that ha are able to buy their way out of physical discomfort for a living, they seem to be craving it in their leisure time. And why is that? Uh, and I think that the conclusion from the research is that our bodies, we need physical and mental stimulation. Mm -hmm. We love this objective quantification. I'd love to see I put work in and I see the results. How much work I put in is directly related to the results I get. And in many people's jobs and careers, it's like a, it's not that you're just at chipping all. away at Mount Everest. I don't, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm part of a project. I don't really see progress. And so you get clear objective data. And that was always struck me as quite of an interesting take on the sport. That we're, mm -hmm. And it's hard to explain to like family members or friends. Right. Like, you're crazy. Why yeah. would you do this to yourself? I've never equated or thought about the uh, quote-unquote income level of yeah. someone or the type of job they have. But I think back... At my career, and, and Rose, my wife's, you know, when we came to San Diego, I was teaching school and making, oh my gosh, I think it was, I thought about the other day, like $9,100 for the entire school year. Didn't know what I was going to do for the other three months. Yeah. But, I, but we did run a lot. We worked out a lot. We got into races. And we didn't have any money. But that gave us an outlet. And I think what it does, it teaches you to succeed. Mm -hmm. It teaches mm -hmm. you to set those goals and keep attaining them. I knew I didn't want to make $9,100 a year for the rest of my life. Now, did, did running and working out in endurance sports take me to a higher level? I truly believe it did. Mm -hmm. But you also have to stay in balance. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen people all of a sudden discover endurance sports and everything else goes by the away. wayside because, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, look at me, because it becomes me, me, me. Mm -hmm. The job starts taking a hit, the family, the relationships, mm -hmm. but man, they're running the fastest 10K they ever ran in their right. life. So I've seen a lot of that too. And then they wake up and they turn around and they rebalance themselves. So it, it's an amazing journey that endurance sports can take you on or sometimes take Challenge away from you. you. Right. Yeah, How yeah. much do you know about the athletes as they're crossing the line? I mean, you've obviously just got a name and a number, right? But are there some athletes that you know a little bit more about their back? Oh, sure. It, uh, you know, over the years, there's a lot of repeat. I call them my repeat offenders, you know. <laughs> hey, here they come. Oh, he's back. <laughs> and then I'll see the name and I'll go, I'll, then I'll go to the bio. Gosh, I, I think I've called him like 10 times. I go, this is, he's going for number 11. I go, oh, yeah, I knew I'd call him out a lot. But uh, I read, of, of, before every event I have, I read the bios. I read at least five times through them all. And I don't wow. memorize, I just recognize. Mm -hmm. So if it's Jane Smith from Des Moines, Iowa, 
I know she battled breast cancer and survived or is a two time survivor. That'll click. And all of a sudden when she's coming in, I go, there's something about her and I'll see the bio. And since I've read it a few times, you can pick I can it out. knock it out quickly because somebody may be right behind her. I got to go to work on them right. too. Mm-hmm. So you want to give them their just due, but you can't go five minutes because there's other people coming in. So I don't memorize it, but I read the bios a lot and some will stick out and then I'll, I'll shade them out. So on race day, when it comes up, I go, oh yeah, this is the That's dude that came story. back from Iraq and, you know, and, and. And I just, I talk about them and I, you know, thank you, buddy. You know, you're, you're back. You're doing well. Look at you. And that's all it's, they. Oh, wow. He knows, he knows my name and oh, wow. You know, I've been recognized. It's just, you know, what's somebody's most prized possession? Their name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if they like it or don't like it, it's theirs. It's not going anywhere. Sure. They can change their name, but I, you know, people don't do that as often as we think. So when I say their name, when they're 50 yards down, it's, it's like, wow. it's like a straight, they could be, uh, it's straightening up. They're looking around. Oh no, where's, where's, that, where's my family and friends? Mike's going to call me an Iron Man. Oh, I get emotional just talking about it because yeah. I see what they're going see, through. Yeah. And, and I don't know everybody's backstory. We sure. never do. No. But I always know there is one. And like you yeah. say, somebody wrote their, if they wrote their screenplay, some people put in their bio, I don't have a story to tell. Oh, and I, I go after them on does. race day. I'll bet you do. Like, hey, oh. Jimmy, you don't have a story to tell? I'll tell you one. You just <laughs> went 140.6 miles. You're a damn Iron Man. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I don't say damn, but, yeah. but, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. say, and he goes, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Now he's got a story to tell. Yeah. That's it's brilliant. Just, oh, and that, that, you know, it, that's what really struck me about your book, which came out. Did your book come out last year? Uh, it about came out a year ago? In March. Uh, March of 19. Okay, okay, a while ago. I know. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, Gosh, it's I'm like, crazy. where's the time gone? I know. But I just loved the stories that you told in there. And um, I think the the one that stuck out was the, the couple that had lost their child mm-hmm. through the shooting. That was that oh. was unbelievable. And you, and you think about what endurance sport can give back to you. It can help you deal with grief. Um, you know, the adversity can help you overcome so many issues in your life. It can help you heal. And, and you sort of go through these different chapters of your book talking about these people and what impact the sport has had on them. And it, it's, it's just profound. It is a form of therapy. And, I, um, yeah, I just I love those stories. I had, I had a woman come up to me at an event uh, a couple of years ago, and it was the uh, next day at the award ceremony. And I just got done to the award ceremony. I'm walking away. Mike, can I talk to you? Sure, what's up? I, I need to tell you something. And I go, what's that? Thank you so much for bringing me in. I go, sure, you know. Uh, where you, I asked her name, where you're from, and had a conversation. And she goes, I need to tell you what this is doing for me. I go, what's it doing for you? She goes, it's keeping me sane mm. because I'm on the edge up here all the time, and it keeps me on the other side of the hill. Mm-hmm. It keeps me, she goes, I know if I take this out of my life, and some people want me to take it out of my life. They think I'm going overboard, but I know where I'll go mm-hmm. if I take it out. I go, That's good true. for you. Keep it in, and I can't wait to see you the next time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go sign up now. <laughs> She's not yeah, really I go, That's so cute. Oh, my gosh. You know, and she yes. was late 40s, and yeah. she just realized on her own. Yeah, that I so got cool, isn't it? I find the, the physiology of kind of what happens to your body and your brain when you're actually exercising pretty fascinating. And we've spoken a bit about it in previous podcasts, but um, certainly in terms of the, the, the mental side of stuff, the sort of eye tracking that occurs when mm-hmm. we're moving through space mm. is similar to a form of therapy they use now for PTSD. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically as you're moving through space, your eyes actually naturally track from side to side. And what it does is it sends a signal to your limbic system to kind of calm it down. Um, So we now know that there's neuroscience behind why we feel better when we're outside exercising, propelling ourselves forward. Mm -hmm. And so there's simple things like that that actually have a physiologic change in your body um, to, to help you deal with, you know, different scenarios. 
Um, and I know for myself, I mean, I grew up running over the hills of Scotland when I was a teenager and really struggling with kind of being bullied at school and not fitting in. Hmm. And it was like my solace. And I felt like um, I felt special because I was experiencing something in the world in that moment that no one else was. And it made me feel different and, and unique. Um, and I just absolutely, I absolutely love that. Um, and then I think as well, feeling pain, there's something about pushing through pain and I don't know if it's to do, and so I can talk more, more about this, but the deficit model of, of kind of happiness. Yeah. Um, so it's quite interesting about how we find happiness or how, you know, it's not something necessarily we, you know, you, you find, but it's the actions that you take on a daily. Right. (laughs) And so one of the theories at the moment is that. Uh, the brain has a sort of, um, a sort of a, it's an intro, we're all born with the same chemical soup in our heads, right? We've all got the same ingredients. We're all baking different cakes with those same ingredients. But in order to feel content and to be flourishing, so in other words, we're not just absent of mental illness or bad health, to really be thriving in life, you also need to feel those moments of a bit darkness mm-hmm. or discomfort. And without, if you don't have those, it's really hard to feel what it's like when things are going well. And so this is one of the theories behind, they discovered this when, you know, for a bit of a tangent, but it's a fascinating one. Like people who won the lottery, they return, within three years, they return back to their pre-win happiness yeah. levels. And that was always curious, right? Now you've got all the resources you need. And there's a weird thing in the brain, they call it hedonic adaptation, that we get used to pleasure. So in other words, we'll never be satisfied. In Mm -hmm. fact, it might be impossible, the human brain, to ever be content. We're always looking for the next thing. And so one of the things of happiness research is to say, it's all around you all the time. So to be present, and that's what endurance exercise really forces you to do. You have to stay in the moment. Um, and then also, if you if you don't have much discomfort in your life, if you've been lucky enough to be able to have an education and a background, employment and financial security, that you're not enduring unhappiness or discomfort on a daily basis, we find ways to engineer it, like taking and doing endurance sport when mm-hmm. it's difficult. And so it's a pathway to happiness by those moments where we've all felt like this is the worst thing oh my god this is so difficult who 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 i'm never doing this again they psychologists call it thoughts of escape you know polite way of saying but afterwards we're signing up for another one and it's, so you need those you need that discomfort in order to feel the happiness uh, and that always struck me and i think that's a lot behind what people get out of some of these events I, there is no different i'm sure yeah no i mean i'm definitely the same I, I, it's almost like i you know every every Everything I do every day almost, it's like I, I have to have some form of suffering before I reward myself with some kind of pleasure. And it's a cycle back and forth, back and forth. Training's the same. Uh, racing is the same. You know, working at the computer is the same. And I think just getting that sort of dopamine surge of setting something, setting a goal and achieving it gives you that dopamine hit, which we know kind of fuels motivation to continue on. Um, and we always speak to our athletes about that. You know, you never, you never uh, do an Ironman or you, you never get off the bike thinking I've got a marathon to run. I've got, you know, right. 26 mile repeats kind yeah. of a thing. You segment it. So you're always achieving something and getting that dopamine hit. So there's so many physiologic reasons as to why endurance sport is as effective as it is. Um, but yeah, I think, and you know, what was also nice about your book was when you talk about the club, Mm-hmm. which is, you know, kind of like your tribe, right? In Xterra, mm-hmm. we call it the Xterra tribe. And um, I think it's because we bond uh, through vulnerability, not right. through strength. I mean, you um, wanna, you, you want, we yeah. all want to be around people that like what we do and we like what they do. That's just human nature. Uh, but take a look through COVID over the last year. What have we seen? We've seen... People riding by my neighborhood. I I never. Where'd this guy come from? Where'd she come from on the bike? Where? I look at all these walkers. Look at a, and what are they doing? They're doing physical activity to cope with the moment, and the moment is a long period of time. We didn't know it was going to be like that, and I'm start. I'm seeing more and more of sticking to it, and I'm going. See, we were right all along. Our endurance sports and working mm-hmm. out is mentally taking care of them so they just don't give up. Yeah. And, and if this went on for another 12 months, the best thing you could do 
is keep doing what you're doing, keep working out, keep getting that physical activity to stay balanced. And and we've been touting that for years. We know, you know, after working out three days in a row, you take if you take a day off because your body needs it, you physically need it, there's always something physically you want to do. Mm-hmm. Whether it's lift weights or do yoga, then you go back into the training. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what gets us through the toughest times of our lives. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times when people go through tough times, they shut everything down. Mm-hmm. And that's why, talking earlier, the, the addictive behavior that mm-hmm. people have, whether it's drugs or alcohol or gambling, or you know, they jump into it wholeheartedly mm-hmm. because they have no other outlet. Yeah. And I'm not saying endurance cures those things, but it can certainly arrest it if you right. go out and get yourself good therapy. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's funny because the, the Strava last year, they came every year they have this end of year report Port. that summarizes all of the, you know, the data points from the previous year. And the nice thing about Strava data is that it's, we've got now you know, year in, year out data of how many people, what they were doing when, okay, they're a bit of a weird group, people yeah. on Strava, because they're <laughs> like us, right? They're athletes usually already. Yeah. And what they found in the pandemic year, certainly for uh, 2020, was that exercise pretty much across the board. Okay, they, they, it, it's largely running, hiking, biking, and so on, not swimming. But, and oh, they found yeah. that exercise went up three times. People were, the, three, there's three times more exercise globally. You name the country, you know, there's 180 countries or something represented mm-hmm. on Strava. And one of the interesting findings, the exercise that went up the most, more than anything else, was walking and hiking. Now that to might seem a bit odd because you think in athletes they'd be doing more, more they are doing more biking. biking as well. But the biggest jump, and for me because they're already athletes, that tells me that people are using exercise as medicine, exercise as therapy. Mm-hmm. It isn't just about the training for fitness because going for a hike or going for a walk for fifteen minutes is probably not going to help you run an iron, run a marathon. But they were doing it for the mental health. And and for each country when they had their lockdowns because they can plot all of this data over time. You could go into Greece and see when the lockdown, or Italy when the lockdown. You see this drop off in exercise or indoor activity went through the roof. The yeah. moment the the lockout, the the lockdowns were lifted or eased, outdoor exercise went through the roof again. People needed to exercise; they just want to. They needed to do it, mm-hmm. and I found that really powerful. And it's also kind of heartwarming, right? That people are the role of exercise in the, particularly in the endurance community. It isn't just to for the for the lycra and the accolades and the medals it's also for your own mental health it's just a part of who you are i I actually wrote in in the book about there's people who obviously coping with loss uh coping with ptsd and i put in there i said maybe down the line it won't be rare if we see a doctor prescribe uh, do a prescription and write a script for go do an endurance event yeah. As opposed to any medication. Right. You know, I, I mean, it's yeah. wishful thinking, yeah. but yeah. I think it would work for a lot of people. Well, plus what? as well, what's, you know, I think when, uh, so I've been reading a really interesting book, uh, The Coddling. The, oh, The Coddling of the American Mind, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that, you know, facing adversity has such profound changes. Mm-hmm. Again, on, on your actual brain, your brain physically changes. It's called neuroplasticity uh, in mm-hmm. response to adversity. Mm-hmm. And so it can therefore cope with more moving forward. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's almost like working a muscle, right? And I think these days, you know, we've kind of molly coddled, whether it's our children or ourselves, where we don't want to face adversity and yet it has this amazing impact yeah. on making us stronger for the future. And that's another reason probably why people gravitate yeah, the towards... Sort of anti-fragile. The, it, one of the examples they gave in the book was, if you can imagine, like if you gave a baby a, 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 a glass glass and they dropped it and it would smash on the floor. Now, if you gave them a plastic you know, sippy cup, dropped it on the floor, over the years it might bend or scratch or scrape. But if it was the if it was sort of rubberized or as you drop the thing, it actually the, the cup got stronger every time it was dropped. And that analogy that like we use in fitness all yeah. the time, right? Overload, you actually get better by, stressing. you know, doing it by stressing the body. Yeah. And the brain is, is the same thing. And that's why it's an anti-fragile 
like um, uh, sort of teaching skill, right? To be able to do things that are really difficult. So, and when they start to prescribe exercise, and doctors have been doing that for some time now, because we know that it helps, is now there's evidence that it helps yeah. reduce depression and so on. But a lot of that, there's still some resistance to it. And they might be because some doctors are themselves, they're overweight or they smoke and they feel a bit like embarrassed that they're trying to prescribe something. But getting exercise as a therapy, physical and mental, is such a, a huge, important piece of our lives. And wouldn't it be great if we could do that through organized sport? Because my other little pet peeve is about competitiveness. Is. Yeah. And yeah. I think competitiveness, we've all almost engineered, well, we're not engineering out of schools, but we are trying to say it's all about participation. And competitiveness is, if it's in a healthy way, is as natural and important as, you know, as anything, any other experience that you have. And that's why I love competitive sports still. You don't have to just be mortified if you can't win, but putting on a number getting those nerves, duking it out with the guy next to you for 117th place. I've been there. It's important. You love it. It's like, it's the, and you've probably seen it, people it, racing to the finish and they're miles behind the lead. It doesn't matter, but that in the moment, yeah. we love it. I mean, I mean, you know, my son played baseball and then, uh, got paid to play baseball and went through such uh, uh, transformations mm -hmm. his entire career. Mm -hmm. Daughter, gymnastics, went through such transformations. And what it did, it set him up for today. Right. And I'm seeing it now on a grandson who's six years old, who's putting on a little league uniform. It's so cute, but he's realizing there's a team aspect. And you know what? If you win, you win. If you lose, you learn. And right. that's what you have to teach him. Yeah. Because we're, we're, you know, especially baseball, that we're a baseball family. It's a game of failure. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, truly. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. Let's go out and fail all day long and go back and do it tomorrow. And all of a sudden you get that home run, you go, all right, I learned something. So we're just trying to teach ourselves how to hit home runs every day. But mm -hmm. you don't have to. You mm -hmm. hit singles, doubles, that's okay. You know, I, I get a lot of athletes come up to me and go, well, I'm working out, and, but I'm never going to be as fast as Leslie Patterson. I can't do what she does. I go, but you know what? You're getting the exact same thing out of it. So true. The exact same thing out of it. She walks away with a smile on her face, feels better about herself. Sure, she won the race. You walk away in 130th place. So what? You're feeling the exact same as she is. Maybe better. Mm -hmm. Probably know. probably better. <laughs> probably better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you yeah, know. And mortgage depends on it. <laughs> that's why people come back to the finish line the final two hours of, of an Ironman. Yeah. They're watching people transform right in front of them. And so many of those people were told they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And yet... And they're, they're walking away with as much grace and dignity and passion and fulfillment as, as the world champion. And I just love that word transformational because I'd say that a huge pivot point in my personal career or my personal journey uh, is when I won Worlds in 2011 and I actually came back from a, a puncture, a flat tire, and um, was, you know, 10 minutes down going on to the run and ended up you know, winning with half a mile to go. And Why? really... Why? What, what was the point? What, the, the point the, was when I got the flat tire, I was in the absolute pole position to have the best race I'd ever, ever had. Up. And so that choice in the moment of, do I just give up? Do I just kind of pack it in? Or do I um, focus on the fight and feel grateful and good that I gave everything given the circumstances? Then there would be no regret. Uh, and that's what I did. And as a consequence, ended up, you know, sort of passing uh, Melanie McQuaid, it was half mm. a mile from the finish line, um, having thought that that was never possible. So my mm. own personal journey, and, and that's taken me now through different careers, different titles, different races, mm -hmm. that if I just keep pushing to the end, keep going, keep going, keep going, something will happen. Mm -hmm probably in, in a positive way. And, you know, now Simon and I are moving into the film career. I mean, it's absolutely the same. You're going to have, what, 60, 70 no's, a thousand no's before you get a yes. So you have to keep your eye on the prize and keep pushing forward and learning from each no and keep moving to the next one so that you can finally get to the yes. Well, I think endurance athletes are less likely to give in and give up. Right. Because you've you've... You've done so many things through your life and, and, mm -hmm. and trying to get to that finish line. And some people don't finish races. There's DNFs. Mm -hmm. That's okay because there's another race. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, and you go into a, I just can't imagine in a film career and, and people telling you no, 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 mm -hmm. no, 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 no. But in your mind, you're going, 
I only need one, yes. I only need one finish line. Right. So I'll, I'll find it. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, finding your finish line isn't about that event. It's finding it every day. Right. You got to have a little finish line, mini finish line every day. There's got to be something you go for. But I think people aren't used to patting themselves on the back. They're, you yeah. know, we have that negativity bias in our brains where we want to, want to focus on the negativity of something rather than the positivity of it. And I think that that's something we struggle with with our athletes is keeping them, you know, let's give, reward yourself for what you did get done today, not what you didn't. And unfortunately, the world of comparison that we have with social media and all that, it's just, everyone's mm. comparing to everyone else. And so you're always coming up short. And so finding that win every day yeah. is just so, so important. And also appreciating that the, the shitty days are the, are the ones that make you. And, and to be honest, so many of our athletes and, and friends will be like, oh, but, oh, it must be easy for you, Leslie. Or, oh, I bet every session is just awesome. I'm like, you are kidding me. Like 90% of them are crap, you know, or they feel crap or I'm not achieving what I want to achieve. Or, but you always have to find something in the process that has worked for you. And, 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 and keep that positivity to kind of roll you forward to the next thing. It's like when, when I talk to so many pros, and I'm fortunate to be around people like you and, and others, and you can't really find many of them tell you that they've had the perfect race. Mm-hmm. No. I, some are like one. or One. Yeah. I remember one or Dave's two. got, I had one. In a career. And, and I finished, he goes, I had a perfect race and I finished second. You, you know, it. Didn't matter about the win, yeah, yeah. It, but he knew everything was put together and, and you just can't have perfect days and perfect everything. Yeah. And that's, if, if we did, we'd all be laying around weighing 800 pounds going, ah, I don't know, good day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so yeah. you got to have, yeah, yeah. you, you got to have the doors closed. So then when you get to them, you go, I got to figure out how to open this. <laughs> this thing up mm-hmm. and you do and you get to the other side and you find another one but you do mm-hmm. and that's what i love about endurance because we cannot fake it you can't you you mm-hmm. you, you you can you can try to you know squirt, skirt around the issues and cheat or do whatever but but you can't fake it mm-hmm. you start and you finish mm-hmm. and in between it's all you and at the finish line i hope i get to say what you are yeah. or anybody who gives to say what you are because you deserve it yeah mm-hmm. and we've heard you uh, actually record messages on people's phones <laughs> what who, who, who oh my gosh I, it's through covid oh, no, just stuff like what, what what was the one you are married or something like yeah, that oh, i've there done that one... i brought yeah. a couple down the, the funny you know it was, they were in chicago somebody i knew you know said can you please record uh this for us As we get married, we're going to turn around and walk down the aisle and we want you to call us. So I read it all and I I did it and uh, forgot about it. I recorded it and sent it to him. The wedding was like two weeks. And Saturday night, we're driving home from the movies, my wife and I, and my phone rings and it's a guy I know in Chicago. So I answer, Doug, what's up? He goes, where are you at? I go, I'm in San Diego. Rose and I are just leaving the movie theater. Dude, fuck, I'm just listening to your ass break these people down the aisle and in the reception and, and this big Saturday night wedding. And, and I thought you were here. I go, oh, no, I recorded that. He goes, you got to be kidding me. Uh, they had you record that. It's just that is hilarious. And, and then they sent it to me, the reaction. There was a few uh, endurance athletes in the crowd, so they knew the voice. And, oh, my God, you had Mike Riley call you. That's cool. And then people started calling and... But that's the that's kind of impact that you've had in the sport, though, Mike. Do you know what I mean? It's not, not every announcer gets that kind of attention. And I think it's because you care about people and because it has such a profound effect on you. People can feel that energy, can't they? That yeah. positivity, and it's infectious. You know, when people say that, I don't, I don't understand. It's yeah, just you're not. who that's I natural. am. That's natural. Yeah. And, and I never wanted to be, you know, I guess we go through, do, what do we want to be known at? You know, what do you... Yeah. Uh, Sometimes when people say, "Oh yeah, he's our announcer," I kind of don't, I don't like that. Well, yeah, okay, I, I do a little more than that. I think mm-hmm. I want to do a, a little more, more than that. Yeah. And so every event I was at, and we've walked away going, "Oh my gosh, that was the greatest finish line." That was in people oh, high fiving, so and I walk away. Next time, I'm it's raising the bar. Yeah, it's going to be better. And I've said that thousands of times because I know I don't want to get complacent. 
if it's the same for me, I'm, I'm walking backwards. I don't mm-hmm. want to walk backwards. Mm-hmm. And so I, I always want to raise the level because I know when I raise the level, it's for them coming. Yeah. It, What's well, changing their lives? Because mm. ex- it's cementing what they've achieved on a day. Oh, I've, I, I've had women come up to me and she goes, honey, just a second. I want to talk to Mike. And the husband's <laughs> over there. And she goes, Mike, I need to tell you something. That was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. The greatest day of my life. Don't tell my husband. Oh I go, my! No, no worries. And she go run away. They hold the hands. Oh, that's hands. hilarious. I, good, I go, whoa. You know, it's just. <laughs> and sure, they, they could have kids and the babies and their All marriage that. and whatever in their life. But that moment, they Personal never forget. They'll tell me exactly what I said. They'll tell me exactly the song. People will actually tell me the lyric oh, that yeah. was being sung. Yeah. And, and some even say, God, you played that from here. Dude, I got 17 hours of music. I'm not playing any music for anybody That's except right. the, yeah. the, the just winners. Just happen to be on. I can't set up music for, sure. you know, 11 hours and 30 minutes. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, but some people, That's so cool, you know. Yeah. So I think to finish off, I want to ask you this question. When are we going to get you to do an Xterra? I've seen, <laughs> we've we've, we've ridden with you on the bike. Mike. This we're is here, intervention. That's want, right. You yeah. want to get me? Again. Yeah, we don't want to pick your brain. We just I, want to get you to I the love, dark side. I love mountain bike. I love road bike, mountain bikes. I keep falling down. Oh, I keep, oh come I, on! Just, you know. Well, you know the funny thing is, is is that people fear that so much, but it's amazing when you face your fears. What you? Oh, can, I know that. <laughs> I know I can ride it well and the whole deal. So uh, it's uh, one day. I know, one day, right? One um, day. W- one thing before we go is I'd like to ask, and I, I'll, I'll, I'd never ask you, I'll, I would never ask you to sort of say which race you prefer because they're all different and unique in their own way. But you're always there for other people, calling people in. But are there races personally that have had a real big impact on you for a, a very, like, a, a specific sure. reason that are sort of, and they don't, it doesn't, it's not the scope of the race or the side, but just, for some reason about where you were or what you were doing, are there races that are really special to you? Yeah, there, there are. Uh, I remember the first time I was on the microphone at the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon mm. with, with uh, you know, 28,000 people standing in front of me. Oh. And, and never thought we'd gather that many runners in San Diego and starting them. It was a moment I'll, I'll never forget. And so many people since it was here, my, oh my God, this is great. You know, it was like a bunch of kids going to the oh, candy store because we had this huge marathon here. Uh, Ironman Lake Placid is very mm-hmm. special to me because I started there in 99 and haven't missed one since. So it's like when I go back, I now see kids who were, you know, five and six and seven years old now doing the Ironman at 21, 22, 23 years old and come oh. up, coming up and me calling me Mr. Riley. Remember when my mom did it? I'm back. Go, oh my God, this is crazy. So it's kind of a family thing. And obviously Kona, very special place uh, because it's a very special place and everybody wants to be there. So there's, there's races, Ironman New Zealand. It's, it's, uh, I would be there this week. Yeah. Uh, the race was, canceled for another three weeks but i would have probably left and been there you know mm-hmm. uh missing that one is is it hurts Tough. yeah mm. it's well, really such a beautiful voice it hurts on the line. i I, long I think time. i'm just have you just got strong vocal cords or i, I think i'm just irish lucky and foolish <laughs> bullshit i don't know I, you know i don't scream and yell and yeah. i've always done voice things and and i breathe from the diaphragm when i speak over a speaker system and let it flow uh, and I, you know what, guys, I think I will myself. My biggest fear in life, if I, I lose my voice and can't call somebody in, right. mm-hmm. I, 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 they don't deserve, you know, voice? huh? Is it insured? Is it insured? <laughs> Who the heck? <laughs> you want to insure? <laughs> Listen, if JLo can insure her butt, I'm sure you can, uh, <laughs> Mike Riley can insure his voice. <laughs> I, I don't, I've never looked into that. I don't know. Man. Well, listen, Mike, thank you so much for coming today, coming to hang out with us, having a cup of tea. Oh, Got your cup of tea. We didn't get your biscuit, but oh, that's well. Right. That's, that's for after the podcast. Well, thank you very Thanks, much. And Mike. thank you for all you do for our sport. Oh, no. Because you guys, now you guys, what you do for our sport, we need people like you. Because everybody's looking for an answer. What you do is honestly tell them, there's not always an answer, but this is what you have right. to do. There's not always an answer. 
Oh. But and if you haven't reading. had a chance to get it, uh, Mike Riley, oh. Finding My Voice. Uh, it's an incredible read. It's a, it's a one night so it, it, page it, turner. It is. It's a bit of a tearjerker. Clean so. at the ready. There are <laughs> some uh, uh, moments. So uh, pick that up uh, when you can. You'll enjoy it. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, guys. Aloha. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And if you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. If you want to learn more, head over to exteraplanet.com. There you can register for your next off-road race, learn more about this podcast, and find some amazing gear. If you have questions or comments, you can email us at podcast at exteraplanet.com. And if you're interested in learning more about how to master your brain for endurance sports, we've written a book. It's called The Brave Athlete and is available everywhere they sell books. And we even have an audiobook. In fact, we narrate it. Yes, that's not exactly a great selling point.